Hi, everyone. I'm Helen, a former Bazel team member and a co-founder at Enchflow, speeding up your Bazel builds with free remote execution caching and UI. Jointly with Cynthia, a software engineer at Stripe and avid contributor to Bazel, Envoy, and other projects, we will share practical learnings to improve the old contributor experience. In my opening remarks at the very first BaselCon in 2017, I said welcome to the first annual BaselCon. I'm delighted to be here at the fifth annual. We've grown a lot as a community, and that means Basel community gained significantly more contributors. Today, we will share with you the impact community contributions have had on the project and zoom in on specific contributor path and practical tools. We'll also discuss how we can improve the contributor experience as a Bazel community. Bazel was first released in March 2015 and achieved beta status by September. Bazel 1.0 was released in October 2019. And I'd like to say that it took the open source community by storm, but the adoption and contributions happened quite incrementally and expanded significantly in recent years. To highlight some of the longest uh, standing contribution, here we go. Many of these uh, contributions actually came from Bazel's early adopters, companies like SpaceX, Wix, Stripe, and Uber. For example, Rules Scala, an initial collaboration between Stripe and Wix, happened in February 2016. Keith has been a prominent contributor of Rules Apple, with as many as 60 contributors involved now, many of them external to Google. Some projects like Build Farm and Build Barn have been primarily created by external contributors and are now used by many companies at enterprise scale. And Rules Scotland, a project was, uh, which was created in February 2018, is one of the most popular projects with contributors. Open source contributions don't just come in the form of code. We have an active community of contributors who file issues and improve documentation. In fact, many of some of these prominent documentation uh, changes led to creation of many other contributor uh, projects. And through the documentation, I met Cynthia and was inspired by her story and her contributor experience, which I'd like her to share. Hi, hey everyone. I'm Cynthia. And here, over the next couple slides, I'm going to discuss a general path to contribution. It's going to be useful for every single project in Bazel, as well as just projects in general. It's the path that I follow every time I'm looking to contribute to a new project. And hopefully, it's helpful to you, whether you're newly contributing to a project or if you maintain a project, there will be some tips in there for things that you can do. So let's go in. So the first step of any contribution is to investigate which issue you're going to choose. And the one thing I want you to remember before you do that is that contributing is very hard. Everyone gets confused sometimes whether they're a Bazel veteran or whether they're just coming new to, to Bazel. So you may be looking through that list of issues and you may be having a really hard time finding an issue that you find is, is totally understandable. And that's okay. Right, Everyone has that fear of contributing, even if you've been, uh, like I said, a longtime user. And to prove it, I link this Bazel issue below, issue 12386 on the core Bazel repo, where this is an issue that I actually filed and I just got confused multiple times throughout. Uh, that's a particular quote of mine where it's like, I just have no idea what was happening and we actually had to hop on a call in order to figure it out. Like. These things happen. It is 100% okay to get confused. Don't worry about it. The important thing is taking that first step and learning over time. Everyone's always learning. No one knows everything. So what, what do we do next? Well, the first thing I would recommend looking for is looking for issues that are particularly tagged for beginners or people who are getting started. Right. So many of the rules repo will do these beginner tags as well as getting started. Basil Core doesn't yet, but most of the rules repos do. So what happens if you run into a repo without these labels? Well, the best thing I would recommend is to look for active issues in areas that you feel most comfortable with. So if you feel most comfortable with documentation because you're just a user and you don't want to jump into code, or if you're feeling particularly knowledgeable about 
the way a certain thing works in Bazel. Look for issues that are along those lines and are active. Because if the issue is active, the chance of someone responding to you as you have questions goes way up. So finding those active issues and not droning up issues from four years ago is a good way to make sure that you actually get some support and some help as you move on. And the last thing is reproducibility is key. Even if you don't fully understand the issue, if you can reproduce it, you can mess around with it as much as you want, whether that be in a debugger, whether that be actually just changing things to try and figure out how something works, how the docs, if you have a reproduction case or you're able to create one that fully represents the issue, you're then able to do everything else. So always look for that reproduction case before taking that issue. So you've chosen your issue. The next thing I would recommend looking for if you can't find an issue this way is to actually look at mentorships. So sometimes this is just sort of like a lower maintenance where someone has commented on this issue like, hey, I can help. This is a huge thing that you can do if you're a frequent contributor to a project. Even if you don't have time to take to an issue, just letting people know that you can be there to answer any questions they have can be a huge relief to someone who's looking for their first issue. Right? This is a very, very helpful thing to do, and being that helpful source to them is very helpful. Some projects also have these sort of like higher maintenance programs right, where you have to sign up for a quarter and some mentorship sign up. This isn't as common in Bazel, but I still want to call it out because I hope Bazel does it more. The CNCF does a great mentorship program, so if you're looking for any ideas, they have a very, very good mentorship program that I definitely want to call out. Anyway, that's all about choosing issues. What do you do after you've chosen an issue? Well, the first thing I would do before actually commenting, hey, I'm going to take this issue, is make sure you're fully set up and ready to go. So if you're working on docs, make sure that you've checked out the documentation locally, and you can not only view it, but edit it and see your changes in your browser. Right? If you're working on code, make sure that you can build all of the code and you can test all of the code without any errors, so that way you're sure you're working from a good base. I actually want to call out Bazel Core here because Bazel Core has a really good documentation setup for building Bazel either with Bazel or just from scratch for the first time. I followed it multiple times and it's worked every single time I followed it. So I really want to call them out. It's a fantastic job. So once you have all of that coding, all of that documentation ready and set up and you've chosen your issue, you can go ahead and make your change and throw up a pull request. And that's what comes next. So once you throw up your pull request, the important thing to remember is empathy. Empathy is the key word for working with pull request reviews because sometimes reviewers are going to leave comments that may sort of ride that line and it's best to always follow it with the best intentions, put, putting the best foot forward for them. Everyone wants what's best for the project and they may not word it the best way because communication is hard, especially when you're not physically talking to someone. But as long as you're empathetic, you will have a good PR review experience, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully there's no other bad experiences. And I want to call out here, I've seen some people take this empathy and PR reviews a little bit too far to the point where they are just taking whatever the maintainer asks them to do without fully understanding it. So don't be afraid to sort of ask the maintainer to explain if they're asking you to make a change and you're not sure why, or even if you don't agree with it. Uh, this is a particular documentation change I made that's actually still open at this time. I have to go and close it. But a documentation change I made where someone was suggesting a new wording from what I chosen, and as much as I'm happy to change it, right, it didn't strike at the issue, the heart of the issue of why I filed the pull request. So I was able to say, hey, that doesn't quite get why I was filing this, this pull request. What do you think about something else? And acting with that empathy and just not you know, calling them out and saying, no, that doesn't work and saying, no, this is really what I was trying to get at. What do you think about this other example, though? Just that general form of empathy has led to a really good PR review experience. So once you have filed your PR, then comes all of the fun part, taking the next issue. That's what everyone likes to think of, right? You just take the next issue and you take the next issue and you take the next issue. That can be a really good way to learn parts that you already know more, right? As you take sort of these larger and larger projects. But I actually really want to call out a second thing, which is providing help in either Slack or in other issues. This is a great way to learn more about a project, especially in an area that you don't know as well. Even if the question has already been answered by someone who has known the answer, 
just being able to dig in and find out like why that answer is correct is a great way to just learn about other parts of the system without sort of any sort of high risk or just delving through the code base mindlessly, right? Someone asks a pointed question and you go and dig all the way through and figure out why, what the answer is and why the answer is that way and share that context back. This not only helps you, but the person who was asking the issue, this is a great way to help sort of expand your knowledge in a code base. And it's something I see that's way too often overlooked. So definitely make sure to provide support. And that's it. That's how you become a Bazel contributor. All right. As you heard uh, from Cynthia, there are quite a number of uh, interesting things we, we can do as uh, contributors to Bazel. So what can we do better as a community? First of all, adding a beginner issue label. That seems like a helpful way and, and is a good example we've seen in the Envoy community. As a contributor of a particularly complex project, we also suggest that you send your design document first to get feedback and so that you don't surprise by a super complex PR that requires much more significant review. Um, an active code owners and rules maintainers community also means that we can get feedback on designs uh, from each other or from a selected group of people in the community that can help for example, it was exciting to see Google add uh, some of the prominent contributors to remote executions, such as George, uh, Ed, and Ulf as code owners for remote execution parts of Core Basil. Another example uh, is the rules, uh, where there is a very active community and it's a great way to get started with your first contribution. Creation of SIGs, special interest groups, we've seen that uh, from other projects like TensorFlow and uh, Kubernetes can help drive community discussion and prioritization. We already have a good start with remote execution led by Steven and rules authors led by Alex. And mentorship. As Cynthia mentioned, this is an important aspect of a contributor success. And, ex and as external contributors, we can self-organize to create a men mentorship list of individuals on topics that they can mentor. And as a contributor, you can reach out to that group. Contact me if you have ideas for how to best implement this for the Basel community. And more tailored, more tailored training, especially focused on the contributor path. In partnership with Benjamin Mushko, who created the Getting Started with Basel book, we are co-developing the Basel Learning Paths program. This is a hands-on program that addresses diverse delivery methods such as docs, instruction, and code labs. And we are open sourcing the content to the Basel community, starting with early version pretty much now, and welcome your feedback and help in testing things out and making it accessible to all. Let us know how you'd like to partner on it. This is our Basel community. We get more value through contribution, design, and idea exchange, and partnerships. I reached out to Basel experts, companies, and individuals, and most of them are excited in partnerships with us to make this community stronger through tools, documentation, and sharing of our experiences. Join us and join the party to make your mark on Basel. Hi everyone, I'm Ethan. I'm a software engineer at Google and I'm working on making hardware easier to build for everyone. At Google, we've seen how the growing demand for compute has outstripped the ability for the silicon industry to provide it. With new applications in machine learning and simulation, it's more important than ever to talk about custom silicon and how it can improve your projects and businesses. Historically, building silicon has cost millions of dollars and taken years of time. I'm here to talk to you about how Google is trying to reduce this cost to thousands of dollars in just weeks of time with our open silicon strategy. At Google, we believe the only way to open up the silicon industry is to build an open source tool chain around it. We're interested in building an open source community in the same way that GNU, GCC, and LLVM built a community around software. 
We're here to enable companies and hobbyists alike to build completely new kinds of products and applications with silicon. We love experimentation at Google, and we want everyone to be able to experiment with hardware the same way they do with software. So building silicon in this new way is going to be very exciting and different. We're targeting multiple open source tools. We're looking for fast iteration times measured in minutes. Open source manufacturing data so that you can get started right away without asking anyone for permission. And we're looking to do this all with Bazel to coordinate them. I'd like to set the stage with a few definitions so that everyone can understand some of the terminology in this talk. RTL, in the same way you think about C++ encoding your logic and a compiler targeting a particular CPU like x86, RTL is the equivalent of a hardware programming language. You encode your logic and control into a language much like you would with any programming language, and then a silicon compiler will target a particular manufacturing process to turn that into real transistors. The first step of this process is synthesis. These tools will take your RTL, which is again, just like a hardware programming language, and turn it into abstract representation in terms of gates and transistors. So things like multiplication, addition, ifs and ors, all get turned into individual transistors and gates. Then it's our place and route tools job to take these, this abstract representation of our circuit, which looks a lot like a graph at this point, and put it on a virtual silicon wafer. Because a silicon wafer is flat, we have to figure out a way to put all these elements on our virtual silicon without them overlapping or breaking any of the rules of the manufacturing process. And our place and route tool give us a GDS file back. This file is what we hand off to the manufacturer to actually harden our silicon into something real and tangible. So graphically, this is what the flow looks like today. You start with your RTL, which we support too today. Verilog, which is a very industry tested solution that's been used for many, many years. And XLS. XLS is Google's high level synthesis tool. And this lets you actually write and build hardware in C++ or a Rust-like syntax. And this might be more familiar to software engineers um, who haven't worked with hardware as much in the industry. The next, next thing we do is we pipe this into Yosis. Yosis is our open synthesis tool. And this, again, will map our programming language into the tiny transistors and gates we need to represent that on silicon. Next, we take it to place and route with OpenRoad. OpenRoad is a project we're really excited about, and we've been supporting both with developer time and some funds. And it'll take our abstract representation of our circuits with AND and OR gates and put it on a silicon wafer. We then stream out the contents from OpenRoad into a tool called KLayout. KLayout will run some checks and make sure that we aren't violating any rules of the manufacturing process and emit our GDS file that we can take to Skywater, who's a foundry we particularly like, uh, to manufacture it. So I mentioned that you can use Bazel to do this. And so something we've been investing a lot in is turning this large flow and complex process into simple Bazel rules. So like I said, there's a lot of software involved in building hardware. And at Google, we know better than anyone that Bazel is an excellent tool to aggregate software from different programming languages uh, and different compilers so that we can have a fully hermetic hardware build tool chain. And so we built all the open source tools in Bazel with our Bazel HDL repo. And we support two languages, as I mentioned before. We support Verilog and XLS. And we're really excited about XLS and its ability to reduce the amount of time uh, it takes to develop a piece of hardware. So I want to show you a little bit how you can design your own hardware with our Bazel Rules HDL repo. Much like you would any Bazel rule, you load it, and you can create a Verilog library. And so it takes 
sources the same way a CC rule or a Java rule would take them. And we aggregate them all into this library rule. And so, as mentioned before, we're taking that counter.view file, and this is what it looks like. So what this piece of software or this piece of code does is it counts up one at a time every time the clock cycle goes high. And it'll reset once it reaches its top value. One important thing to note in this file is the top level module. In this case, it's counter. And so this is important as we need to specify a top module to our synthesis tool so it knows which part of our hardware we'd like to actually turn into reality. So next, we need to synthesize our Verilog library rule. We do this by first specifying that counter top level module I pointed out before, and then providing a dependency to our Verilog library rule. And you can chain these together in the same way you can with a Java rule, or a Java library or a CC library. And Bazel will take care of concatenating your sources and making them available to the synthesis tool. Next, we have OpenRoad, which is doing our place and route. So again, we load our rules from uh, the location I mentioned above, and then we point it at our synthesis result. So once we do that and specify some other parameters, like the clock speed, how dense we'd like it, and what size we'd like our silicon, we can build hardware with Bazel. So if we run Bazel build and wait about 48 seconds, we'll have hardware out on the other side. And so this def file is the output of our rules today. And you can actually take that def file into klayout and view it. And like I said, in just 48 seconds, we built our very own custom silicon chip. And on the right, you can see what that looks like, containing all the transistors, wires and hardware needed to represent our counter circuit. Each wire in this picture is about 130 nanometers wide. At that scale, you could fit almost 800 wires side to side on a human hair. And there's a little zoom in of one particular gate in our circuit. Well, building, soft or building hardware in software is all fun and games, but I think we'd like to build our hardware too. And Google thinks it's important to support this community by getting it built for free. So Google started a project uh, with eFabulous to manufacture any open source design for free. We have multiple wafers going out every couple months, and any open source design qualifies. All you need to do is provide us with GDS, and we'll manufacture it and send you back parts. And you can go to that link below. Uh, to find out more about what the exact submission criteria are. We also have built a Slack community with almost 2,000 members of varying degrees of skill, some who've been in the hardware industry for 20 to 30 years, and others just getting started. And we'd love to have you there. And we're in a very excited community. So if you have any questions, there's more than hundreds of members who'd be happy to answer them. The next thing I'd like to ask you is to contribute to some of the projects that I mentioned before. We have OpenRoad who is doing our place and route, and it's a very exciting piece of software that has tons of algorithmic complexity if you're into that kind of thing. We have Yosis who's doing our synthesis. We have Klout who showed us our pretty pictures and did some of the streaming for the manufacturing process. And then lastly, we have our Bazel Rules HDL repo, which lets us use Bazel to build our hardware inside Bazel. And lastly, that XLS repository is really exciting. I think it has a lot of potential to make it a lot easier for software engineers to design custom hardware. So please, if you have some time or are interested, check them out. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Starlark Debugger Deep Dive. My name is Paul. I'm the founder of StackBuild, and I've written a number of um, Starlark rule sets, such as StackB Rules Proto. I help maintain some of the core rule sets, such as Rules Docker, and I've written a number of tools along the way, including a, a Bazel build uh, user interface, um, Starlark language server, and now a debugger that I'd like to share with you today. So let's get started. 
Uh, this is an overview of what I'll talk about. So we'll talk about what you can do with it, um, who the target audience is, what the architecture looks like. We'll take a peek at some of the server flags and look inside the server implementation to get a better sense of what it's doing. We'll peek at the protocol a bit and some of the message types. And then we'll take a look at the debug client, both as a standalone CLI and in the uh, IDE. So since we're talking about Starlark, it's worth mentioning there are three implementations. The one written in Java, uh, which is inside the Bazel build code base. There's also a mature Go implementation, as well as a Rust implementation, whose maintainership has recently transitioned to Facebook. Uh, all three have their own debugging capabilities, but we'll just be looking at the one inside Bazel today. So the debugger experience can be a little frustrating. So it's not something you're likely to recommend to your average developer who's just trying to figure out why their build is broken on CI. Rather, it's more suitable to rule set authors or core Bazel dev developers in an organization that are trying to get a better understanding of some Starlark behavior. Um, the debug experience starts with the long running Bazel server, which advertises the debug protocol over port 7300. And they exchange asynchronously messages, messages um, according to the Starlark debugging protocol format. And um, optionally, in this architecture, we also have the IDE connecting to the client over a different protocol, so-called DAP protocol, um, which is going to act as a debug adapter. So the core uh, debug server is implemented inside this Starlark debug package. This is a fairly simple Java package that wraps and hooks into this core Starlark engine. If you didn't know already, you can um, check out the Bazel code base and with a sing sim single Bazel run command, you can drop in into a Starlark REPL. And uh, I definitely recommend uh, doing that sometime. So let's take a look at the flags um, that you'll want to be using. The first one is this experimental Skylark debug flag. This is the only one that's required. And when this is invoked, the server will pause, waiting for a client to attach. Optionally, you can customize the port, but usually the default works fine. And then there's this uh, flag to enable verbose logging. I would almost always recommend this, but occasionally you'll hit a complex variable, and the attempt to serialize that to the client uh, will just really halt a debug session. So use it at first, but you probably don't need it going forward. The TLDR on this slide is that the Starlark debugger module is only active with the build command. So the flags will really have no effect with query or test, for example. And if I had to distill the debugger implementation into one spot, this might be it. And essentially, when the debugger is active, anytime a Starlark thread is about to arrive at some particular location, it, there's a callback and the debug implementation gets a opportunity to pause the thread or do additional operations at that time. Okay, to summarize then, we have the experimental Skylark debug flag in conjunction with the build command that allows you to do thread operations at the level, at the statement level. Okay, let's peek at the protocol a bit. This uh, client request uh, implementation kind of gives you a sense of the types of messages and what you can do with things. So you can list stack frames, you can set breakpoints, you can continue, pause, step through threads, and then there's evaluate and get children, which I'll address separately. So when a client issues an evaluate request, it's essentially sending a raw Starlark string, and that gets installed and evaluated into that particular thread with its current state. Unfortunately, the way the debugger stands right now, evaluation always occurs in the global file scope. So that's less useful because you can't really see what's happening with variables inside of a function or inside some you know, if statement. Uh, so that is usually um, IDE hovers are powered with evaluate and also conditional breakpoints uh, don't work. So there's some limitations, but as long as you're aware of them, it's okay. The get children API is used to facilitate a drill down approach to complex objects. So if 
an object has internal structure, it's given an ID, and that ID is then used for a subsequent API call to retrieve the child nodes of that object. In an IDE, this is usually represented as like an expandable trig item view, for example. And this slide gives you a sense of the types of objects which do advertise internal structure. A notable exception to this is the provider object, um, which is unfortunate because provider is probably one of the more interesting objects you might want to explore, but just as long as you're aware of it. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about the client implementations. So the reference implementation is Bazel Build VS Code Bazel, which is written by Tony Olivado and colleagues. Um, Laurent Lebrun has also written a Go implementation. And this one, based on the Bezel tool, is uh, based off Delve, which is a popular debugger for Go. Also a shout out to Torgal Svensson, who presented at the last build meetup um, about one written in Python. You can find his talk online. So um, this is a subcommand of this bezel tool. You can curl and download this and use it however you like. If you're using it at scale within a large organization, we ask that you get it properly supported. Um, but otherwise, it's the BZL debug tool. And what happens when you invoke that is it'll drop into the CLI and attempt to attach to a server. And when I'm running this, I typically like to have two terminals open, one for the server and one for the client that I can see at the same time. And so that's what we'll look at uh, right now. So here we're running the server. It's now waiting to connect, BZL debug, now it's connected. Okay, it's paused at line one of this thing called default workspace. We'll look at what that is in just a second. And we can use uh, commands like T for listing threads or F for listing stack frames, L for local variables, G for global variables, of which there aren't any right now. We'll look at those in a minute. So uh, let's digress just for a second. What is this curious thing called the slash default workspace? Well, when Bazel parses your workspace file, what it actually does is it prepends content before and after to install built-in workspaces like Bazel tools, which can't be overridden, and then things like the local JDK and any number of remote JDKs you've probably accidentally downloaded at some point or another. There is a subcommand called default workspace content, which will prepare these files. It makes the debugging experience just a little nicer, but it's optional. All right, well, let's look at something a little bit more interesting. And specifically, let's use the debugger to ask, how is it that something like rules go can compile two binaries on different platforms during the same Bazel build command? So here I'm building a command called gen copy. It doesn't really matter for the demo what it does, but when I build it, as expected, I get a binary that's compatible with the host platform in this case, Mac. If I add the dash dash platforms equals label pointing to some platforms rule, then um, I get a cross compiled binary that's compatible with Linux. This in itself is rather remarkable, but what if I don't want to compile everything for the same platform all during one build command? And what I can do in this case is remove the dash dash platforms flag and use the goose and gorch, apparently uh, that's how they're called, flags, and move those into the Go binary uh, itself. And then when I build this, I get one binary that's cross-compiled, one that's not. So this is kind of crazy because it's as though I've invoked different command line flags for different parts of the build graph. So this is called a transition, and it has a special rule called transition and there's a transition implementation, like a rule implementation. And so let's look at that uh, using the debugger. But I don't really know even where to start with this. So I'm going to use a different tool, which is a code search tool, to kind of narrow it down. And in this slide, uh, what I'm going to do is build a search index based on a Bazel query, and then use a search command to look inside that Bazel query. So it's kind of like live grep for Bazel queries. So here, I've used the build files um, 
operator. And so this builds a search index based on all the transitive BZL and build files for that Go binary. And I can search within it. And I've searched for the string GOOS. It only has a few hits, which is nice. And the file called transition BZL looks like the most interesting. So I've opened that up and I've looked through it a little bit and I have a sense of where I want to put my breakpoint. And so we'll go ahead and do that now. Again, I'm going to have two terminals open, one for the server and one for the client. So this is what that looks like. So we'll go ahead and launch our server. Now it's waiting to attach. Debug is now attached. It's in transition BZL at the start of the file. I'm setting a breakpoint in line 125. It's going to show me where my breakpoint is. And then what I can do is then uh, inspect local variable. No, I'm continuing. So I'm at I'm hit the breakpoint line 125. I can inspect local variables. Here, this, there's a dictionary called settings, which actually has a mapping between the platforms flag and this host platform. And we're going to watch that update. So what we're going to do is step SSS as we go through the code here. And we're going to drop into this if statement about GOOS. And what we're going to see is this platform string being constructed and the settings dictionary updated. We can reinspect our variables, local variables. Here, the platform is indeed changed to Linux AMD64, and we've updated the dictionary. Now, this settings dictionary is the return value for the transition rule implementation, and that is actually what a transition is in Bazel. So you're just updating the settings dictionary based on some conditions. And that's it. So that's pretty cool. So let's take a look at what this looks like in an IDE. So for that, we have a separate subcommand called BZL debug adapter. Flags are the same. Otherwise, as a new bind port address that defaults to 4711. And um, to do this, I'm going to also have two terminal windows open, one for the server, one for the client, and then we'll look inside the IDE. Um, before that happens, we need to have a launch configuration for VS Code. This is called launch JSON. And this uh, extension Bazel stack VS Code can provide this configuration for you. Um, so let's see what that looks like. OK, so we're starting our server, blocking. And the debug adapter is now running, waiting for its communication. The debug server port defaults to 4711, so that's good. We're going to start a session. OK, we're paused at the beginning of the file. Now the ergonomics of setting breakpoints is a lot nicer, obviously, in the IDE. So we can just set a breakpoint, line 154. Let's continue. Now we've hit the breakpoint. We're paused at that point, And we can step through and we can watch this platform flag being constructed and the settings dictionary updated and the rule transition sort of effectively occurring. So that is it. That is a rule transition in Bazel, and it's pretty cool. We can see it happening in the debugger. Um, so it's taken me a while, but I actually do like this experience. Um, uh, what I typically do is just leave this BZL debug adapter running in a terminal. And if something surprises me or if I get confused by something, I'll start a quick debug session after doing a little bit of research before and just kind of see like where I'm interested in. Um, and that's it. So I do have some a few uh, debugging tips uh, for you at the end. One is simply don't hesitate to make changes within your external output base. I do this all the time. Like for example, here I'm putting a print statement inside Gazelle because maybe Gazelle is running for too long and I don't understand what it's doing. So I'll just go into that directory. Maybe I'll open up a different IDE window and make changes. So that can be very helpful. The next is dash dash subcommands. This is useful for printing the command lines for the actions that are spawned by Bazel during your build. Uh, and that pairs nicely with dash dash sandbox debug. And sandbox debug will prevent Bazel from tearing down or removing all those symlinks and files in the sandbox. So you can change directory or CD into it and do a postmortem, try to figure out why the action isn't working. There's also dash dash client debug. Client debug is a bit more esoteric, but it does tell you events that are occurring inside the front end, which is written in C. And then finally, dash dash experimental UI um, debug all events shows you messages coming across the event bus. And I find this interesting because it prints both when an action starts and ends, which 
is information that's kind of hard to get otherwise. Okay, finally, all else fails, you can attach a Java debugger to the Bazel server using dash dash host JVM debug. Here's a launch sample launch configuration to do that. Good luck. And um, yeah, that is the debugger as the debug experience. Hopefully you'll learn something and hopefully you'll learn something in the future using this kind of tool in the future. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm PCJ at StackBuild and I'm PCJ on GitHub. These are some of my other projects. And um, thank you very much. Hey, BasilCon. I'm Siggy, the co founder of BuildBuddy. Today, I'm going to be talking about running Basil in the cloud with GitHub code spaces and Bazel remote build execution. Before we jump in, I wanna stop and give some quick background on the inspiration for this talk. When I left Google two years ago to join Y Combinator, I found myself really missing all of the world-class developer tools I had access to as a Googler. There was Blaze, Sponge, Tap, Forge, and dozens of other tools that made me more efficient as a software engineer. You really take these tools for granted until you have to live without them. In the outside world, we have Bazel, which we all obviously know and love, which is the open source version of Blaze. For Sponge, Tap, and Forge, there are plenty of open source options available, including BuildFarm, BuildBarn, Brew, and of course, BuildBuddy. But there's one tool I've still found myself consistently missing from my Google days, and that's Cider. Cider is Google's browser-based code editor that allows you to quickly make changes to Google's massive monorepo from any device. Right from within your browser, you're able to kick off Blaze builds and Blaze tests that take full advantage of Google's powerful remote caching and remote build execution capabilities. Today, I'm going to show you how to recreate this setup for your code base using the newly released GitHub Code Spaces feature, along with Bazel's powerful remote execution capabilities. Let's walk through a high level overview of what running Bazel in the cloud really means. First, let's start with local Bazel. When running Bazel locally, everything happens on your developer machine. The Bazel client, the long-lived Bazel server, and all of the many build and test actions that Bazel spawns all run locally. They're competing for resources with Slack, Chrome, Zoom, and all of the other apps you're likely to run on your computer. That means that you're bound by the CPU and RAM limitations of your machine but at least you're not at the mercy of your network. This setup will work just fine offline, assuming all of your dependencies are available locally. Now, when we add remote execution to the mix, we add a remote cluster in addition to the developer machine. The local Bazel server communicates with the remote cluster via the remote execution API. This means we've now made a trade-off. Now, we're no longer bound by the local CPU and memory constraints of our developer machine, but we're now at the mercy of our network connection. If you have slow upload speeds or a flaky internet connection, you're likely going to have a bad time. Finally, when we move Bazel to the cloud, the developer machine just becomes a thin client. The Bazel client and Bazel server will live in the GitHub Codespaces data center of your choice. You can let GitHub automatically select this data center for you, or you can manually select one yourself. This means that the remote build execution API calls that Bazel makes are happening between data centers and not subject to your flaky home internet connection, which we're all a lot more familiar with now that many of us are working from home. 
If you place your code spaces in the same region as your remote cluster, this connection can be incredibly fast. OK, enough talking and diagrams. Let's see the setup in action. You can create GitHub code spaces from any GitHub repository. In the upper right-hand corner of any repo, you'll see a green code button. You can click this button, select the code spaces tab, and click new code space. Alternatively, you can quickly access the GitHub web editor by pressing the period key on any GitHub repo. From there, you can quickly create a new code space using the continue working on button. For this demo, we'll be using the open source Bazel repo. From there, you'll be taken to this loading screen while your code space is created. In my experience, this only takes a few seconds. Now you're ready to go. You have a fully fledged VS Code editor running right within your browser. All of the extensions, themes, shortcuts, and more work exactly how you're used to using desktop VS Code. For those of you that can't stand the idea of using VS Code in a browser window, you can even open this code space using your desktop VS Code editor using the Code Spaces extension. Now that we've created a code space, all we need to do is install Bazel, and we're off to the races. I recommend using Bazelisk because it's easy to install and makes managing multiple Bazel versions a breeze. You can install it with the simple go get command since Go comes pre-installed on the default Codespaces dev container. This just works out of the box. Alternatively, you can also create a Docker file in the .dev container directory in the root of your project, in which you can install Bazel, along with any other tools you might need for development. I also typically alias Basilisk to Bazel, but I'll be using the full Basilisk command in this demo to make sure it's easier to follow along. Now that we've got Bazelisk installed, we can go ahead and kick off a build. Here, we're building Bazel from source using our GitHub Codespaces virtual machine. Once that build completes, we can see we've built just over 2,700 actions in about 1,000 seconds. Dividing by 60 shows us that building clean Bazel from source on a fresh GitHub code space takes just over 17 minutes. That's definitely not blazing. So let's dig in and see what's going on. The first thing you'll notice when kicking off a build in a code space is that this pop-up appears during the build, which says that we're at 100% CPU utilization for our code space. That's a pretty good hint that we're CPU bound. Pulling up the timing profile for one of these builds shows that we're only running four jobs in parallel for this build. That makes sense because the default GitHub Codespaces machines only have four cores and eight gigabytes of RAM. If you're like me, your immediate next reaction is to try running your code space on more powerful machines to see how much power we can squeeze out of one of these things. Unfortunately, when you go to change the machine type in your code space, you're met with a friendly contact our team message to enable the more powerful machines. Not to worry though, because we want access to way more than 32 cores anyway, which is their largest machine type. So let's go ahead and add remote execution to the mix. Here, we have modified our Bazel command to enable remote build execution for our build. We've first run a clean with a dash dash expunge flag to make sure we're not dealing with any local caching. We've also added a no remote except cache flag to make sure you don't introduce any remote caching. The other flags here are relatively straightforward. You can of course add these to your Bazel RC file but I've chosen to place them here on the command line to make them easier to follow along. 
I'll quickly walk you through these flags for those of you who are unfamiliar with remote build execution. The config remote option sets the various platform and toolchain flags needed for the Bazel project to build remotely. If you haven't configured one of these for your project yet, you can use the Bazel toolchains repo or Grail's LLVM based toolchain as a guide. The remote executor flag points to BuildBuddy's free tier cloud remote execution service. But you can use any remote build executor here. There are plenty of other open source alternatives, including BuildBarn, BuildFarm, and others. The remote download minimal flag enables Bazel's build without the bytes feature, which minimizes the number of outputs that get downloaded to the Codespaces machine. The jobs number specifies that we'll be running 1,000 actions in parallel, compared to the four that we were able to run locally. Finally, the remote header flag allows us to set a BuildBuddy API key that associates the build with your BuildBuddy account. When we run this configuration, it completes in just over 150 seconds, and 2,689 actions were run remotely. That comes out to about two and a half minutes, or about 6.8 times faster than the local code spaces build. This particular run was on a cold cluster that had some auto scaling to do in order to bring more executor nodes online. Running on a warm cluster that is already scaled up brings this number down to 109 seconds or about 1.8 minutes. That's pretty nice. And there are plenty more optimizations we can make to get this number down even further, like enabling persistent workers and playing around with the number of machines we're running on. In the previous example, we'd intentionally disabled caching to make the comparison against clean local builds more fair. Now, if we run another build with remote caching enabled, the build completes on a clean code space in about 20 seconds because it's remotely cached. This still feels a bit slower than we'd like, so let's take another look at the timing profile. Here, we can see that about half of these 20 seconds are spent in and before the analysis phase. This means that there's a good 10 seconds before we even begin any remote build execution. It's pretty common for this analysis phase to last even longer, especially for projects that pull in a lot of third-party dependencies. I've seen this take several minutes or more on even modestly sized repos. So how do we avoid this analysis phase? One way is to configure a repository cache to remove the need to re-download third-party dependencies. But this only solves part of the problem. A more comprehensive solution is to use a warm Bazel process that has much of the analysis phase cached and any third-party dependencies pre-downloaded. You can configure this with many popular CI providers, and we've even launched BuildBuddy workflows to make this super easy to get started with. With a warm but clean Bazel process, we're able to run a fully cached build in about seven seconds on a default code spaces machine. You can get this down to about 2.6 seconds by making sure your cloud Bazel instance is running as close to your RBE cluster as possible and by using more powerful VMs. This can be several times faster than a fully cached local build, depending on how slow your home internet connection is and how far you are away from the RBE cluster. From there, you can modify your source in your browser and perform incremental builds that complete in just seconds. So obviously improved build times and test speeds are a great benefit of running Bazel with remote execution in the cloud. But those aren't the only benefits. Running Bazel in the cloud helps improve the reproducibility of your builds. When using a shared caching setup, many common causes for cache misses come from very slight differences between developer machines. When developers use the same base image and the same remote VMs, many of these slight differences completely disappear. The pains of cross-compiling from Mac hosts onto remote Linux executors also disappear. 
running Bazel on remote machines also means you need less powerful hardware locally. You can do more development on your laptop or even on something like an iPad for those of you who are into that kind of thing. Running Bazel remotely means you get the advantage of data center to data center network connections between your Bazel server and your Bazel remote build execution cluster. If you're anything like me, you're probably used to canceling all local builds before you hop on a Zoom call to make sure the fan noise doesn't drown all, out all of the other meeting participants. This problem goes away completely when you're running Bazel remotely. And finally, it makes contributing to new code spaces a breeze. You can start from scratch and have a fresh instance ready for development up and running in well under a minute. So this was a super brief introduction to running Bazel in the cloud, but there are many places you can take this powerful idea. In this demo, I showed you how to use Bazel remote execution with GitHub code spaces, but there are many other projects that offer web-based IDEs that you could use instead. There's Gitpod, which recently open sourced their open VS code server. There's also coder.com, which maintains the code server open source project. I've even gotten Bazel with remote execution running on Replit using their new Nix integration that supports Bazel. Another feature that GitHub Codespaces is offering in limited preview is the ability to pre-build Codespaces when changes are pushed to your repo. This would allow you to even further reduce the startup time for your contributors by creating a pre-warmed container that's ready to go and gives you incremental builds from your very first run. At BuildBuddy, we're working with Firecracker micro VMs to enable pausing and resuming warm Bazel instances with their analysis cache fully intact. Finally, by introducing a Fuse file system, you could imagine opening up a workflow that uses Cloud Bazel to non-web-based IDEs. Stay tuned for more here as well. As we've seen over the past months and years, developer workspaces are increasingly moving to the cloud, and Bazel is perfectly positioned to take advantage of this trend. Thanks for listening. I hope you got some useful ideas and concepts out of this talk. If you're interested in anything I talked about today, please message me on Twitter where I'm at Siggy or send me an email. Also, if you love Bazel and love making developers productive as much as I do, we're hiring engineers at all levels at BuildBuddy. So please shoot me an email if you're interested. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of BazelCon. Thank you for coming. My name is Alex. I am a software engineer in the Google Cloud Client Libraries team. I'll tell you how my team switched from using multiple Docker containers to a Bazel workflow. Let me start with a short description of our workflow. We develop code generators that produce hundreds of client libraries for various Google Cloud APIs in seven programming languages. The source code of all the libraries is stored on GitHub. And from there, we publish them to the corresponding package managers, such as NPM for TypeScript, PyPy for Python, and so on. And today, we are going to talk about the generation part of the workflow. There is a separate uh, code generator for each of the seven languages we support. Each generator takes an API definition on, as an input, and those definitions are in protocol buffers format, published on GitHub. So technically, each client library generator is a plugin for Proto-C, the Protobuf compiler. I won't go deep into the client library specifics here. Uh, please check out aap.df for information about our standards for proto definitions and aap.dev slash client libraries for the client library generators. It's important to know that each generator is written in the language it generates. That is, the Java client library generator is written in Java, the TypeScript generator is written in TypeScript, and so on. 
The main reason for that is that we want the language communities to be able to contribute to the generators. So we have seven similar but separate generators, and each of them requires the setup for the corresponding language to work. So we needed to have seven language environments for generating client libraries, so Docker was an obvious choice. So we had a Docker image for TypeScript generator that had Node.js inside, and then we had a Docker image for Python generator, and so on for all seven languages. And we had a spec that defined how all these images should behave. And it all worked, but the complexity of the infrastructure was just a little bit higher than we wanted. First of all, uh, dependencies and uh, generator updates. Uh, with Docker images, it's not only a Docker file update, but you also need to rebuild and publish the images. Then everyone who needs to build client libraries needs to have Docker installed which is an extra dependency of the developers' machines, and not only our not all our developers actually use Docker a lot. And using this setup and continuous integration requires a lot of plumbing, and there are a lot of moving parts. Uh, having reproducible builds is hard because, you know, having that many images, even if you carefully tag them, something will go wrong if you try to rebuild some older code. And finally, uh, running a generator by running a Docker image is pretty hard. You need to pass a lot of parameters like mount, input, and output directories. So we had a lot of shell scripts that, sh that set various parameters for each API we build, and they basically acted as wrappers for the Docker run command. And so to make a long story short, it was uh, pretty, pretty complicated. So Docker Images helped us uh, set up the workflow in seven languages, but it became obvious that we needed something else. So we realized that we needed a build system that could execute Proto-C plugins that are written in various languages that could keep track of all the language runtimes and dependencies, could generate reproducible builds, and could be run locally by engineers without a lot of uh, setup. So as you, as you probably guessed, we switched to Bazel. Now let me talk a little bit about our current setup on Bazel. We don't use the per language uh, Docker images anymore. We still use Docker here and there, especially in continuous integration jobs. But we have just one image with Bazel inside, and the, do the, the jobs just run Bazel to build everything. As I mentioned earlier, we have all our input profiles published in a GitHub repository. So this repository became a Bazel workspace. The workspace file is uh, the single place where we can control the generator versions to, that we use and all the common dependencies, such as the protobuf library. The client library generator for each language became a Bazel binary. We have generators written in seven languages, so the full build of the workspace uh, loads and runs the code written in all those seven languages. Changing the generator to, became, to become Bazel binaries uh, was easier for some languages and harder for some other languages. Like, for example, for Java, Python, and Go, it was pretty straightforward to do since we have uh, Java binary, Py binary, and Go binary rules. For TypeScript, it was a little bit less straightforward. Uh, some code needed to be changed because it relied on relative file locations, like the existence of the build folder, and it all has changed after moving to Bazel. Also, there were some issues with the protobuf.js library that wanted to install its dependencies by calling npm install directly. So we needed to make some minor changes here and there to make it work. And uh, the other three languages we support are C Sharp, Ruby, and PHP. Uh, we are aware that there are implementations of uh, C Sharp rules, Ruby rules, and PHP rules. For various reasons, we weren't able to use the existing rules, so our team members implemented our own c -sharp binary, Ruby binary, and PHP binary rules, and these rules can be found in the source repository of the corresponding generators. Uh, now let's talk about the generator dependencies. Each generator defines its dependencies in macros that are defined in repositories.bzl. Here is an example from the TypeScript generator that loads Node.js rules. Generators may have common dependencies such as protobuf library, so we use maybe uh, to make sure we only load each dependency once. And now since all generators live in the GitHub repositories, 
they need to be loaded from the main workspace file as dependencies. This is an example of loading the TypeScript generator from the workspace file. We have the same HTTP archive rule for all the generators. So after we loaded each generator, we need to use the macro to load the dependencies of each generator. That way, all the individual dependencies are managed within the generator repositories, and in the main workspace file, we just load the generators using the specific versions. We also need to execute some extra actions like installing dependencies, like the yarn install rule here. Now let's take a look at the actual rules that we use for building all client libraries. Each version of the proto definitions for each API lives in its own directory. So here we have uh, two versions, v1 and v1, v1, beta 1 of the speech to text API protos. And each version has its own build file uh, that lists generator targets for each language. But we have a separate tool that can generate these build files for new APIs. Uh, this is a snippet taken from the build file for the Google Cloud uh, speech-to-text API. This snippet uh, defines a TypeScript client library target. Here this GAPIC part of the rule name is a name we use for Google Cloud client library generators. Each generator implements its own rules uh, that generate and pack uh, client libraries, so we have some Starlar code in every generator. If we look at the parameters for the rule, uh, we can see some parameters that we need to pass to the generator along with the protocol buffer definitions. Uh, previously, when we used Docker, these parameters were stored uh, in the shell scripts, and now uh, we store all these parameters in the build files. They are the source of truth for all configuration for the generators. So to summarize, at this moment, uh, we have an automatically generated build file for each API and each build file has targets for all versions. Uh, engineers can either build a specific target, like build a speech API client library for Node.js, like the first client here, or they could use the star syntax or a triple dot syntax to build multiple client libraries for multiple APIs. Uh, that's what we normally do in our continuous integration tasks. Uh, the build of uh, library in a clean workspace is, in fact, pretty fast. On my laptop, it takes a little bit longer than two minutes to build one library. That's when I start from a clean workspace with no cache. So basically, downloading and building all the dependencies, protobuf library and such. Subsequent builds are, of course, almost instant. In total, at this moment, we have about 300 build files in the workspace and rebuilding the, the whole workspace without a cache takes about 20 minutes in continuous integration. Now let me talk briefly about our next task that we are working on. Uh, a big improvement to our workflow will be to compile the generated client library code and run the generated unit tests right after the build. So you could say a Bezo test and immediately test the generated library. Uh, we already have this for Java, but not for other languages at this time. So we are working on adding that. So currently, uh, we run the unit tests for the generated code uh, separately in continuous integration, and moving this step to Bazel will simplify our workflow even further. Everything I described in this talk is open source, and it's all available on GitHub. Uh, the main repository with protobuf definitions and Bazel build files is github.com slash Google APIs slash Google APIs. And the generator and the rules uh, are all in the corresponding uh, language repositories, uh, GAPIC generator language. So please feel free to take a look at how this works and uh, we'll appreciate any questions or feedback. Last but not least, I wanted to acknowledge the work of all the team members who worked on this project. Their names are listed on this slide. This was a big transition, uh, so thank you folks for making this happen. And that's it. Thank you for watching.
Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Moshlob and I'm honored to be here today at BaselCon. I'm gonna tell you about how we're using Basel at VMware to create a more accurate and efficient open source licensing compliance process to address challenges with our current solution. I've worked closely on this project with Rihanna Tabasum, Mark Zarian, and several others at VMware. We hope this talk and our work will inform the design of general purpose licensing infrastructure for the Basel community. With hundreds of thousands of open source projects to choose from for a developer, open source software is a vital component of almost any code base, sometimes making up more than half of the code base. And with over 80 licenses, each requiring its own unique care, complexity of managing open source software cannot be overlooked. At VMware, like many other organizations, product releases must comply with legal and license requirements of open source software. For us, this process adds friction to the development cycle, sometimes results in product release delays, and has occasional inaccuracies. To solve this problem, we've created a new open source compliance process rooted in Bazel. I'll first give you a little bit of background about open source license compliance. Then I'll expand on our current workflow and its shortcomings. And finally, I'll tell you about our solution. In order to comply with the licenses for the open source software that VMware uses in its code base, we must first identify all the open source packages that we're using. This is like having a haystack full of needles and needing to find all of them or face legal and security risks. Second, all the open source must be tracked so legal and security teams can approve or deny the packages. If a package is found not to be fit for use at VMware, the package must be removed and the code must be refactored. And finally, we must be with compliant with the licenses of the software we use in our products by providing the proper documentation upon product release, where documentation requirements vary by license and by package. The ideal scenario is to have a process for identification and tracking of open source software in order to reach license compliance with the least amount of toil, inaccuracies, and product release delays. The way in which open source compliance is accomplished varies by organization. Let's take a current look at the workflow that we use at VMware. In the current workflow, there are two strategies for a developer to gain approval for open source package usage. The first option is for them to run a local build use a CLI tool to scan for open source software and use another CLI tool to file tickets to track the open source software. In the second option, a team can set up its own continuous integration pipelines where after developers check in code, new builds are triggered. The latest build artifacts are scanned for open source software and tickets are created for any newly added packages. After tickets are filed to the OSS review tool, people from the legal and security team review the packages asynchronously. If any package is found denied for use, developers are notified and the package must be removed. And there are some pain points with this workflow. First are the manual steps that are required. This leaves room for human error, such as when having to run local builds or using multiple CLI tools to identify packages and track them. Second, is that each team has to set up and maintain their own scanning pipeline. Different products have different configurations to account for different package managers. And because of this, there's no standard process for all teams to follow. The manual process for each team to set up their own scanning pipeline is another source of human error. For example, we encountered a team that was scanning the unit tests instead of the deliverables for their product this resulted in packages being reported that weren't actually shipped. Conversely, there are scenarios where packages are underreported. In those cases, packages are potentially shipped without first being reviewed or declared. The third pain point is that scanners sometimes don't produce all the required information we need to know about an open source package, leaving some information missing. The first example of this is that scanners can't always determine whether a package is shipped or if it's for internal use only, like for testing. This overreporting adds cost to identifying and tracking tickets. In fact, these internal packages made up 20% of the tickets filed, 
incurring a huge amount of wasted manual labor from developers to rule out these false positives. In the second example of this missing information, scanners cannot always identify how a package is used, such as if it's dynamic or statically linked. Filling in missing information like this is a manual process, leaving room for error. For example, during one of the first releases of a product with Bazel build binaries, the linkage was mistakenly changed from dynamic to static. This slipped under the radar until it was caught in the last second before product release, causing a headache to correct the error that should have been avoided. The fourth pain point is the toil and the feedback loop when developers add denied packages to the code base. An open source package could be denied for legal or security reasons, and a developer will have to remove and factor the code, remove the package and refactor the code. To handle this, we have a Slack channel integrated with a scanning tool that tags product owners with open source packages needing removal. The owners have to identify the developer that introduced the package and delegate the task to remove it accordingly which requires Slack messages, emails, and sometimes even bug tickets. This can be especially inconvenient when a developer adds a package to the code base that was already denied, and they don't receive feedback that they need to remove it until days or even weeks later. Because of this, developers cannot easily make informed decisions about implementing or choosing open source packages. To address these pain points, we set out to design a new solution. Our goals were to minimize toil and product release delays, improve the accuracy of open source packages we identify in products, and support multiple programming languages so any team at VMware using Bazel can use our solution. And we did just that. By using Bazel as the foundation for our open source license compliance process, we experienced many benefits. First, we can create an accurate, deterministic bill of materials containing all open source with each build. There is no need for a separate open source scanning step in the post-build stage. This removes toil and room for errors from developers. Second, open source validation happens at build time, and developers are quickly informed about any problems with the open source software they've introduced or the existence of any denied packages in the code base. Open source decisions are made earlier on in the development and review process, making them less costly. Additionally, common causes for product delays are mitigated. In the third benefit, Bazel's multi-language support allows us to have one tool that works cross-platform. This removes scanning pipeline setup and maintenance from a team's responsibilities. Now let's walk through how this works. We start with a Bazel build that just produces an RPM package with a project source files using package RPM as seen here. Previously, there would have been a post build step to scan the RPM that we produce. But now with our new solution, all that we need to do is add a new rule called OSS audit into the Bazel build. The OSS audit rule consumes a Bazel aspect that analyzes the dependency graph of a build and collects information about each package. Additionally, it consumes a list of previously approved and denied open source packages, usually determined by a legal or security team, to alert developers when denied packages are being used. After the aspect traverses all the dependencies, OSS audit outputs two files. First, it creates a bomb YAML file, which includes information on each open source package. And second, it creates a bomb issues file containing a subset of open source packages that have been denied for use by the legal or security teams or that are still waiting for approval. Developers and release managers can use the bomb issues file to identify problems or packages that may block or delay product release. This is the workflow for using OSS audit. Now let's check it out how it works in action. This is how OSS audit can be added to a build file to audit an RPM. In this example code, you can see package RPM rule below creating the RPM and the OSS audit rule above auditing the RPM. The solution can audit RPMs, TARS, and other build targets, but it's currently over only aware of Java dependencies via metadata from rules JVM external. Don't worry, it can be extended to support other target types as well. 
We are currently developing a prototype that supports C++ and have plans to support other languages soon. The approved and denied lists inform OSS audit about which packages are approved and denied and provide extra metadata as well to be included in the bill of materials, such as copyright notice and how a package is used. All open source packages will show up in the BOM file, but a subset of the BOM containing only denied and pending packages will show up in the BOM issues file. Now, let me show you a demo where I'll apply OSS audit to a simple example project. The project that we'll be auditing is an example project from the Bazel build repository on GitHub. It's a Java application that compares two numbers using the instock-compare method from Guava. Guava is an open source project, and looking at the workspace file, we can see that it's being imported here using maven install from rules JVM external. Checking out the build file, we can find a Java binary that, when built, produces a jar for our project. Here's the jar. And we could go ahead and directly audit this Java binary using OSS audit. But to make things more interesting, we're going to make an RPM that packages the jar and then audit the RPM. Here's the code that we need for the RPM. Now we're ready to bring in OSS audit to audit this RPM. And here's the OSS audit code. The source is the RPM that we're auditing. And then here are the approved and denied lists. The approved list has one entry. The key is the package identifier for Guava. And the values are information from the OSS review tool. The denied list is empty, and we're ready to go ahead and audit this RPM. The audit gives us a bomb and a bomb issues file. Let's first check out the bomb file, which contains all the open source packages discovered during the build. Looking at the bomb, there are several entries. The key is the package identifier, and the value is information discovered about the package during the audit. If you remember, we were only depending directly on Guava. So the rest of these packages are transitive dependencies. Looking here, you'll see the copyright notice for Guava. This is an example of how information from the approved list makes its way into the BOM. Now let's check out the BOM issues file. The BOM issues file contains all the packages that are waiting for approval or denial from legal and security teams. These are all the transitive dependencies of Guava. What happens when we add a package to the denied list? Let's add findbugs JSR 305, one of the transit dependencies for Guava, into the denied list. Now, to be clear, there's nothing against findbugs, and I'm only adding it into this denied list for demonstration purposes. All right, let's go ahead and run the audit once more. This time when we run the audit, the build fails, and we have an alert message letting us know that FindBugs JSR 305 is denied and needs to be removed from the code. Now, it might not always be convenient time to remove JSR 305 from the code. So what we can do is we can use a suppress list. This is an attribute of OSS audit, where any packages listed in this list that are denied will not fail the build. It is a good idea to have a bug number here to track the removal of these packages since ultimately they still are denied. We can go ahead and run this build one more time. And we'll see that the audit this time succeeds. We have our bomb file, our bomb issues file, and we're still reminded by the build that there are some packages that need removal. And that's an example of how to apply OSS audit to a project. Now, let me show you how the use of OSS audit can be extended beyond just open source identification. Let me show you a few examples of how we use OSS audit at VMware. The OSS audit outputs can be inputs to other processes to gain legal or security approval. At VMware, a Jenkins server uses the BOM to file tickets for open source packages for review. 
people at the legal and security teams review the packages asynchronously. This Jenkins server also queries the OSS review tool for the latest approved and denied packages, and it creates a new approved and denied list to submit back into source control. Now, if any packages are denied for use, developers are notified the next time a build runs. Now, this is how we've integrated OSS Audit with our existing OSS review tool. To wrap up, let's check out one more example about how we use OSS Audit in our big products. At VMware, our bigger products are constructed of many services. In this case, OSS Audit is used to generate a BOM for each service. These service bombs are then merged together to create one top-level bomb and bomb issues file for the entire product. This gives product and service teams insight into what packages they're shipping at varying degrees of granularity. I've shown you the problems with our current workflow. I've shown you our solution and a couple ways of our solution can be extended. In summary, open source software is a critical piece of almost any code base, but complexities of identifying and tracking it slow down the product development cycle and can result in product release delays. Using Bazel as our foundation, we're able to validate open source usage at build time and produce a bomb containing all open source software in the code base. This gives developers immediate feedback, removes tedious extra steps, and provides a single cross-platform product agnostic tool. We're interested in engaging the Bazel community to see what kind of open source compliance solution would work for the ecosystem. We're looking for feedback on this solution to help it evolve. Our call to action is to visit our GitHub, check out the code, or even open an issue to continue this discussion. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you for joining. My name is Pablo, and I would like to talk about automated migration to Bazel with Iron. So Iron is an open source framework that allows you to automate the migration of your projects uh, to Bazel build system. And you can find this project on GitHub. It's available by the link on this slide. And overall, it consists of two primary components. So first of them is a Starlark template engine. And basically, this is the code generator for Starlark that allows you to define some uh, templates using Kotlin language and Kotlin DSL and generate Bazel scripts based on those templates. And the second component is a migration component, which works as a plugin to your build system, and it gathers all the build configuration of your project and generates corresponding Bazel files uh, using a template engine. If you want to learn more about the project, please feel free to check out the blog post and the links to it you can find uh, on your screen. But before actually considering the details of the migration flow, let's think why would even why would even need to uh, automate the migration. So basically, imagine working on a large project that consists of million lines of code, has uh, hundreds of modules, and uh, is being maintained by hundreds of engineers. It would be really hard to manually create all the Bazel scripts for such a project because you also need to expect constant updates uh, into the build configuration of your initial build system that are done by your teammates who are doing some product work. And it's important to understand that the migration of large projects to Bazel does not happen overnight, but it happens gradually. And this means that uh, during the migration, you would have two active build systems in your project. And moreover, the first one, the initial one, would be the source of truth in this case. And therefore, it's important to have a quick mechanism of regenerating all the Bazel scripts in your project after any update to the configuration of, of the builds of initial build system. And here is one Iron can actually help you. So how does it work? It starts all with the initial build system. So the migration component from Iron gathers all the build configuration from your project. Uh, and this can be the list of modules in your project, the list of dependencies for each of those modules, and many more properties. And based on that, 
it can generate uh, the corresponding Bazel scripts with using a Starlock template engine. And when it comes to the supported build systems, initially Iron supports Gradle build system, and this also means that it supports migrating Android projects. And the integration is done by using a Gradle plugin. But it's not limited with it, because Iron is extensible enough uh, that it can support other build systems, for example, Maven, or even moreover, it can uh, support Xcode and other build systems. But you may ask, so how does all of this work together? Because uh, Gradle and Maven are written in Java, while Xcode is written using languages such as C or Objective-C. And the answer is the Kotlin multi-platform. Iron is written in Kotlin language, and it leverages the powerful feature of that language, which allows it to be compiled to different platforms. So the core migration component of Iron is built as a Kotlin common module. And this means that it can be available to all platforms. However, when it comes to Gradle or Maven build systems, they are being built as the Java modules. And therefore, those components have access to Java SDK to, and to specific APIs of those build systems. And the same way, integration with Xcode can be done. While Kotlin native can be uh, compiled to the native binaries, it can interact with the C code, and that's how it can provide support for Xcode. So at this point, uh, Gradle is already supported, while support for Maven and other build systems is being developed. And now let's dive deeper into the Starlark template engine and see how it can help us to improve the code generation process uh, for Bazel. So it follows three primary goals. So the first one is it must provide a declarative code generation. This means that all the code that describes the code generation must be as similar as possible to the actually resulting ending generated code. Moreover, it must provide a type safe API for the code generation. This will prevent many errors during the compilation stage on the coding side. And moreover, it must be available as a standalone component. This might be useful in cases when you don't need the, all the migration logic, but you just want to have a lightweight tool uh, for convenient generation of Bazel scripts. And this can be done with Iron. And the code generation overall happens using template. So for example, imagine you, you have a large project that has uh, like hundreds of Java modules. Most likely, Bazel scripts for those hundreds of modules would have a lot, a lot in common because all of the, them are using like uh, Java rules and pretty similar configurations. And by using templates, you can define the general skeleton for all of those modules while having uh, placeholders for unique data for those modules. For example, you can see that this is a valid code and those placeholders can be filled in uh, with, the, with the variables, just regular Kotlin variables. And when we are using the template from the previous slide, we can generate multiple uh, build configurations, Bazel scripts uh, from it for multiple modules. And they will be pretty similar, but their unique details would be different. For example, for module A, we would have a unique name of the module A, and also we would have a list of dependencies that is applicable to module A. And the same can be done with module B and like many other modules. And now let's talk in more details about some advanced and more complex uh, Stagelark scripts. And let's see how Iron can generate code for them. So in this slide, we can see that we have a list comprehension that for each file in the list of files, it would create a target using general. And as we can see, uh, this code uses uh, slice expressions and also concatenations. And let's see how it can be generated using Iron. So here you can see the valid Kotlin code and the usage of DSL that Iron provides. So let's see in details how it works. So first we can define and generate the variable assignment. And it's important to note that uh, this SRC uh, files uh, list would be the type of list of strings, which provides a type safety. So next we can just uh, use regular Kotlin function for using a general and like define uh, different calls to rules. 
and it's it's uh, important that we can have uh, slice expressions moreover we can have concatenation expressions and as you can see we have also type safety still preserved so the name expects the type string and if any any other type would be provide, provided uh, so the code import would not compile and the same works with out which expects the list of strings and all of that is wrapped into the DSL that uh, generates a list comprehension. And basically the file argument in the Lambda corresponds to the item type of the list that we are working in. Um, and again, it preserves the type safety of the API. And now when we saw how the code generation works, let's see how actually Iron can be used to migrate your project to Bazel. And in this example, we would see how we can migrate Gradle project to Bazel. It all starts with defining a template for your modules. In this case, we define template for all Java modules, and this can be done using just regular coding function. And uh, we can pass arguments uh, that are applicable to specific modules to that functions. It's also important uh, to understand that this code that we define here should not be available to the source code of the application, but it must be available to the class path of the build scripts. And in Gradle, this can be done in many ways, but the simplest one is to use a build src directory. So you can define this directory in your project and write all the code there, and Gradle will treat it in a specific way so that all the code would be available in the class path of the build scripts. So next, we must introduce one more entity, which is called template provider. So the goal of template provider is to map your template to the right type of modules in your project. So for example, we've just created a Java template and this template provider would assure that uh, those templates would, would generate code only for Java modules. And this can be done by implementing two functions. First of them is can provide, which actually takes the module, the Gradle module as an argument, and it checks whether it, ca it has Java plugin um, applied to it or not. And when we check that, we need to implement the second function, uh, which, called, which is called provide. Basically, the goal of this function is to take the template that we've just defined and to fill it with the correct data that is specific to this particular module. And it's important uh, also to understand that uh, in Gradle, we have a such entity called project, but in fact, it means that it represents the Gradle module. So please don't be confused with that. So in this case, we this, this function would be called for each Gradle module uh, in the project. And for each of them, we would retrieve uh, the specific data from that module. For example, we can have the name of the module, and we also can retrieve the list of dependencies that is used in this module. Um, and this is how it can be done. And finally, we, need, we just need to register this uh, template provider in our project. And this can be done in the root build.gradle file using the DSL, DSL that Iron provides. So we can register this template provider and we can register many more. So for example, we can have a specific template for workspace files, and we can have them as many as uh, as we have different types of modules in our project. So once all of this is done, we can just uh, trigger the migrate to Bazel command, and this will allow us to start the migration and generate all the build scripts. And this process can be done iteratively uh, until you have all the templates created for all the types of modules in your project, and this is how it can help you to automate the migration process. So you can find the pro this project on GitHub, where you can find like more documentation and some examples of how uh, this can be migrated. So overall, now the Gradle support is already there, and Maven and support for other build systems is being developed. That's it. Thank you for watching. Hi, I'm Andreas, Developer Experience Leader at Twig. 
We recently implemented cross-compilation support in Rules Haskell, and today I'd like to share some of the things we learned in the process. I would also, also like to acknowledge my esteemed colleague, Facundo Dominguez, who implemented much of this work. Twig is one of Bazel's earliest adopters, a recognized community expert, and a contributor of Bazel features and extensions. We maintain the open source rule sets, rules Haskell, rules Nix packages, and rules SH. Get in touch if you need help with your Bazel migration or improving your Bazel build. Let's talk about cross compilation. First of all, what do we mean by it? Let's start with regular compilation. Say, for example, your compiler runs on x86 Linux, it will produce code that runs on that same platform, x86 Linux. Cross compilation means the compiler produces code that runs on a different platform, for example, ARM Linux. It could also be a different OS, perhaps iOS, or an embedded device. This is particularly useful if your target platform is not powerful enough for compilation. Bazel adds a dimension with remote execution. Say you invoke Bazel on your M1 Mac, and the compiler runs on an x86 remote executor, while the generated binary runs on ARM Linux. So there are three platforms that we need to consider. Note the generated binary in these examples could also be a Bazel test. Bazel uses the following naming convention to describe the various platforms involved. The platform that Bazel runs on is called host. The platform that the compiler runs on is called execute. And the platform that the generated binary runs on is called target. Bazel supports cross-compilation with its platforms and toolchains mechanism. I'll give you a brief overview of how it works. We'll start with platform constraints. Platform constraints tell Bazel how your platforms differ. For example, a platform constraint might describe which CPU architecture to run on. First, we define a constraint setting for the CPU architecture. Then, we define values that this setting can take, say x86 or ARM. You can find common CPU and OS constraints on GitHub at bazelbuild slash platforms. Then you can define platforms that fulfill certain constraints. For example, here we define a platform that consists of a Linux OS and an ARM architecture. Platforms are typically specific to your infrastructure and often defined in your project. The constraint values attribute shown here refers to the constraint values defined earlier, for example, the ARM CPU architecture. Finally, when you define your toolchains, you can declare which constraints a given toolchain is compatible with. The exec compatible with attribute states where the compiler can run, and the target compatible with attribute states where the generated binary can run. The toolchain type declares what kind of toolchain this is, in this case, a Haskell toolchain. To use a toolchain in a rule, you declare a dependency with the toolchain's parameter and extract the toolchain out of the context object in the rule implementation using the toolchain type. Bazel will then hand you the toolchain instance that matches the current target and execute platforms. This brings us to the first few minor things we had to adjust. Most rule sets provide repository rules to provision the appropriate compiler toolchains. Rules Haskell offers a few as well. For this cross compilation work, we use rules Nix packages to integrate with the Nix package manager and import a Haskell cross compiler from the Haskell.nix project. This way, we can reuse the work done by the Nix community and don't have to work out how to build a Haskell cross compiler ourselves. Previously, this provisioning rule hard coded the execute and target constraints. We had to make them configurable to support the cross compilation use case. For now, we only implemented cross compilation from x86 Linux to ARM. But in principle, a user could use Nix to import a Haskell compiler for arbitrary execute and target platforms. So we made the constraints fully user configurable. Under the covers, this function sets up multiple external repositories. We had previously hard coded some of the names for these, but in the cross compilation use case, we needed multiple instances of the toolchain. So we had to make the names configurable to avoid name clashes. I hope this gave you a good overview of Bazel's platforms and toolchains mechanism. 
Next, I'd like to talk about a very interesting challenge that we encountered during this work, toolchains depending on toolchains, specifically the Haskell toolchain depending on the C toolchain. Let's start with a brief overview of the Glasgow Haskell compiler, GHC. GHC compiles Haskell programs to native code. Haskell can link C code and vice versa, thanks to a C foreign function interface. And GHC uses the C toolchain in its compilation pipeline for pre-processing, generating native code, and linking, meaning the Haskell compiler depends on a C toolchain. To support Haskell linking C and vice versa, we have designed rules Haskell such that Haskell rules and Basil's built-in C rules can depend on each other. To be sure that the Haskell and C targets are compatible, we use Basil's C toolchain and instruct GHC to use the tools provided by it. The question is, how should we express this dependency in Basil? Consider the Haskell toolchain definition that I showed you before. Basil's built-in toolchain rule defines the constraints and toolchain type. But the actual specifics of the toolchain are defined in a separate target. Here it is called toolchain impl. The toolchain attribute defines the dependency on this implementation rule. In case of rules Haskell, the toolchain implementation is provided by a dedicated Haskell toolchain rule. You might be tempted to declare the dependency on the C toolchain on this Haskell toolchain implementation rule. In fact, rules Haskell's toolchain used to depend on the C toolchain in a similar way, indirectly through a tool dependency. What's the problem with this approach? I'll illustrate with an example. Let's say we are cross-compiling a Haskell binary from x86 Linux to ARM, meaning the binary should run on ARM. The Haskell binary depends on the Haskell toolchain. The Haskell toolchain runs on x86, but it targets ARM because it needs to produce a binary that runs on ARM. In other words, the target constraint needs to match where the thing that is produced should run. So far, so good. Now let's look at the C toolchain. The C toolchain runs x86, but it's depended upon by something that should also run x86. So it's resolved to target x86. We told Basil that we need a C toolchain to make a Haskell toolchain. And the Haskell toolchain will run on the execute platform x86 not the target platform ARM. So Basil sets the target constraint of the C toolchain to match the execute platform x86, not the target platform ARM. In the cross-compilation use case, this provides the wrong C toolchain. How do we fix this? We make sure that it is the Haskell binary that depends on both the Haskell and the C toolchain. In code that looks like this, the Haskell binary rule depends on both toolchains. We then implement our rules such that it passes the C toolchain to the Haskell build actions as needed. The same kind of issue lurks with build tool dependencies. For example, the rule to build a third party Haskell Cabal package depends on the Cabal wrapper, a wrapper script for the Haskell package manager Cabal, which we use to build the Cabal package. Since it is a build tool, we declare that we need it in the execute configuration. But if the Cabal wrapper itself depends on the Haskell toolchain, then we will obtain a Haskell toolchain that targets the execute platform x86 instead of the target platform ARM, meaning cross-compilation would not work correctly with this setup. The solution is, again, to let the Haskell Cabal binary rule depend on the toolchain. The Cabal rules are an interesting case. It turns out that we actually need both types of toolchain dependencies. We need the cross-toolchain to compile the Haskell Cabal package correctly. But we also need the native toolchain to interpret the package's build script, which is itself written in Haskell. We achieve this by adding another tool dependency to the Cabal rules that picks up the Haskell script interpreter run GHC from the native toolchain. In summary, if the rule depends on the toolchain, you will get the cross toolchain. If the toolchain or a build tool depends on the toolchain, then you will get the native toolchain. Another important subject in Basil in general, but with cross-compilation in particular, are external dependencies. For example, packages from the Haskell Community Package Index, but also things like system libraries. 
In Bazel, we use repository rules to define external dependencies. For example, we use HTTP archive to simply download sources or other artifacts from the web, or we use rules like Maven install from rules JVM external or stack snapshot from rules Haskell to integrate with a package manager. In case of Maven, we can download pre-built jars from the web. But in case of Haskell, the hackage package index offers packages by source, and we need to download and then compile them ourselves. We need to be cautious about when we compile these packages. Importantly, Bazel's platforms and tool chains are not available in repository rules, as they are only resolved at a later stage, meaning the correct cross-compilation tool chain cannot be provided by Bazel in a repository rule. Repository rules are not hermetic. They are not sandboxed by Bazel. If we compile code in a repository rule, for example, by invoking the language's package manager, then it may use a tool chain that is incompatible with our Bazel project. All in all, it is best to avoid building any code in repository rules. Note, this is also a problem for interpretive languages if the package manager builds bindings to native code. Rules Haskell provides Stack Snapshot, a repository rule to depend on third-party Haskell packages from the Community Package Index. It uses the Haskell package manager called Stack to import packages from a curated set of compatible versions of packages called snapshots. The user defines which snapshot they want to import packages from using the snapshot attribute and which packages they want to import using the packages attribute. So how do we avoid compiling Haskell packages in a repository rule? Remember, that would be inhermetic and would not work for cross-compilation. Internally, Stack Snapshot is split, uh, is split into separate stages. The repository rule invokes the Stack Package Manager to perform version and transitive dependency resolution. And we parse the dependency graph and package metadata emitted by the Package Manager. We can also read from a log file to avoid calling the package manager repeatedly. We then fetch the package sources in the repository rule using Bazel's Starlark API. This allows us to benefit from Bazel's repository cache. Finally, we generate regular Bazel rules to build the third-party packages as regular Bazel targets, meaning the Haskell targets are not compiled in the repository rule. Instead, they are compiled in, in regular Bazel rules. We use the Haskell cabal rules that I showed you before to build these third-party packages. For example, the zlib package shown here. System library dependencies form an additional challenge. In interpreted languages, they're often called native dependencies. As most package managers, the Haskell package manager will not provide these system libraries for you. You can declare the dependency, and it will check for the presence of the library, but it will not install it or build it for you in a controlled environment. Instead, it will assume that the library is already installed somewhere and will just link against it. How can we ensure that we use the correct version of a system library? It is important to track these dependencies in Bazel for a hermetic build in general, but in particular for a cross-compilation project. For example, we have imported the Haskell package zlib using Stack Snapshot. This Haskell package depends on the C system library with the same name, zlib. We may need to compile the Haskell package zlib in both the cross-compiled and the native version. We need to be sure that it is passed the correct version of the C system library in both cases. So we need to track this dependency in Bazel. Stack Snapshot lets you declare such extra dependencies for each package that you import. For example, here we declare that the Haskell package zlib depends on the Bazel target czlib. Importantly, this is a regular dependency on a regular Bazel target. This extra dependency is added to the depth attribute of the generated Haskell Cabal library target. The platforms and toolchains mechanism or other configuration mechanisms applies with any other target. If we cross compile the Haskell package to ARM, Bazel will give us a matching cross compiled czlib. If we compile natively, it will give us a native czlib. Does this mean we need to build everything in Bazel, including common system libraries? If you can, this may be beneficial. But defining Bazel build definitions for all these dependencies can be hard and time consuming, especially if you need to support cross compilation. Alternatively, you could check and pre build binaries 
or import libraries from your system's package manager. In this case, you'll want to be careful to provide versions for the different target platforms that are compatible with the toolchains used in your Bazel build. We use Rules Nix packages to import such system libraries from the Nix package manager. The Nix packages project provides build definitions for many system libraries and tools, and it supports cross compilation as well. Nix builds are also cached and tightly sandboxed and in line with the objective to be fast and correct. We use the Nix packages package repository rule provided by Rules Nix packages to import two different versions of the Zlib library, one for x86 and one cross-compiled for ARM. These libraries will be built by the Nix package manager and then imported into Bazel using Rules Nix packages. We can then use Bazel's select mechanism to expose the appropriate version for the current target platform under one alias, meaning when you depend on this CZLib target and build for x86, then you will receive the x86 version of the library. If you build for ARM, then the ARM version. Finally, we also import the C and Haskell toolchains for x86 and ARM from Nix packages. Shown here is the import of the C toolchains. We also import the Haskell toolchains from Nix. This way, we can be sure that system library dependencies and Bazel targets are consistently built with the same toolchains. That covers all that I wanted to share today. In conclusion, use Bazel's platforms and toolchains feature to make use of its built-in cross-compilation support. Consider carefully where you depend on a toolchain and how this interacts with target and execute constraints. Avoid building code and repository rules or import external dependencies using rules next packages in a hermetic and cross-compilation compatible way. A working example of cross-compilation for Haskell is available in the rules Haskell repository under examples slash arm. And the user guide at haskell.build includes a section on cross-compilation. Thank you for your attention. I hope this helps you with your cross-compilation endeavors in Bazel. Hello and welcome to our session. Uh, we are going to talk about IDE support for Java developers with Bazel. And I'm Peter and Gunnar is with me as well. Uh, first about me, I work for Salesforce on a microservices infrastructure team. And so uh, we provide runtime libraries and other tools for microservices developers inside of Salesforce. And one of the things we provide is a monorepo. So it's a large shared source code repository uh, in which we have many of those microservices, and that mon monorepo is built with Bazel. And uh, the main language that is used in that monorepo is Java. And Gunnar? Hi, my name is Gunnar. I joined Salesforce in 2016, uh, and I'm working on a monolith, not on microservices. And um, I'm responsible for the build and development experience of that monolith. And we are still in process of migrating from Maven to Bazel. Um, and this is where we actually need um, support in the IDEs as well. And uh, approximately 80% of our monolith code is, is based on Java. Great, thanks, Gunnar. And first, I just wanted to show a high level overview of how these projects relate to each other. So, uh, so we work on Bazel Eclipse on my team, and Gunnar works on a language server that is used for VS Code integration on his team. And most of the code that we work on is actually shared. So probably 85 to 90% of our code is shared across the two projects in a centralized library that we call the Bazel Java SDK. And that the SDK is a Java library that uh, models the Bazel build and makes it easy to invoke Bazel commands, for example. And so by centralizing it in that SDK, we actually share almost all of the code across these projects and other projects too. So we have a Slack integration with Bazel internally. And so that also uses the SDK. So it's a really powerful centralized uh, library for, for working with Bazel. And so I'm gonna uh, talk about Bazel Eclipse first, and then Gunnar will uh, come in later and talk about the language server and VS Code. And so Bazel Eclipse started uh, three years ago. 
And it was really to meet a need that we had internally. So as we ask microservices teams to move from their custom uh, source code repository with their custom Maven build, and we move them into the monorepo, they have to do some work. So it, it takes some work to, to migrate from Maven to Bazel, from their own repository to our monorepo. And so we have migration tools to help them do that, but there is work involved. And so we were seeing friction for uh, these developers, for these teams to move in. And so we're always looking for ways to reduce that friction. And, and one of the things we realized was not only were we asking teams to change from Maven to Bazel, but for all the Eclipse developers that we have inside of Salesforce, we were asking them to change from Eclipse to IntelliJ. And so uh, it started as a hackathon project three years ago. But uh, what we, we started to do is build the Bazel Eclipse feature, which is, uh, and our goal is to give uh, these developers parity with uh, doing Java development in Eclipse um, as they would have in Maven um, with Bazel. And so I'm I'm happy to report that we are we are there. So uh, as of the 1.5 release of Bazel Eclipse, which uh, happened a couple of weeks ago, uh, we've reached parity. So now uh, the development experience for Java developers inside of Eclipse is the same whether you're using Maven or Bazel. And so we're really really happy about that. Um, and as I'll show in a demo, it's a lot easier to show rather than tell. But we model the um, the Bazel um, the Java class path a little bit differently than what the IntelliJ plugin does. Um, and so, uh, so as, I'll, as I do the demo, you'll see how those differences play out. Um, and we also spend a lot of time thinking about how to do partial imports because um, in, in Salesforce, we have these large Bazel workspaces. We never want a developer to bring in the entire workspace. And so we've, we've put a lot of effort into making sure partial imports work well. And I'll show that in the demo as well. Uh, we're also happy to talk to say that um, we support Windows, and uh, so it's a first-class citizen with our support, um, uh, along with uh, Mac and Linux. And um, so at this point, we have, as I said, parity with Maven. And uh, what we're working on next is just performance improvements for very large workspaces. Um, we're also going to add um, some features for making build file editing a little bit better. Um, but then the, the last major feature that we're really excited about is um, what we call auto dependency management. And so we have most of this already in, in place, but we just need to put it all together. But this will allow us, uh, so when a, um, uh, a developer adds a new import statement to a Java file, we're going to go behind the scenes and, and update the build file to add any new dependencies that they need um, when that happens. So um, that's hopefully soon to come. And with that, I'm not going to talk more about uh, the Bazel Eclipse. I'm just going to show you. So I've got a couple of demos lined up. And here we go. All right, here we are over in Eclipse. And to save time, I've already installed Bazel Eclipse feature in this version of Eclipse. And I've also imported a Bazel workspace. But um, real quick, um, if you need to install or you want to install uh, Bazel Eclipse inside of your Eclipse, there's two ways to do it. Um, we, we support, and, and most people have been installing it off of our update site. So that's uh, in our documentation. There's a URL that you would uh, plug into um, this path and uh, install uh, Bazel Eclipse that way. But uh, more recently, um, we've uh, started to support the Eclipse Marketplace. And so if you go into the Marketplace and search for Bazel Eclipse, uh, we're the only ones in there. Um, so you'll, you'll find us, and this would be an install button. Um, if this wasn't already installed. And so I think, you know, this is probably now the more easier way to go. So I'd recommend this approach. Um, and so once, um, once you have Bazel Eclipse installed and you import a Bazel workspace, and I'll show you the import process in a little bit, but uh, this one's already imported. Um, you'll see how we um, integrate with, um, how we integrate Bazel with, with Eclipse. And the main idea is every Bazel package that you import, and once again, we only support um, uh, Java rules. And so we, we filter out anything that doesn't have um, uh, a Java rule in it. But in this case, this in this workspace, we have four Bazel packages that have uh, Java rules in them. And so we imported all four of those into the workspace here and um, that they became four different Eclipse projects. So these are the Eclipse projects. And, you know, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details. You know, we, we integrate um, 
you know, we, we find the source folders, we find the test folders, um, et cetera. Um, and everything kind of works as you expect. Um, we have a compiler, you know, that'll show up in the problems view down here. Um, and uh, we'll do, you know, uh, type search for you. Um, so, um, you know, you can add types and we'll, we'll um, help you out there. Um, and so um, that's that's all pretty standard Eclipse stuff, and uh, it works pretty well, just pretty much as you expect. The main um, integration point for Bazel Eclipse with Eclipse is the Bazel class path container. And so what we have to do is um, uh, look inside of each Bazel package that's been imported and look at the Java libraries, look at um, you know the Java binaries, the Java tests, and figure out the class path container. And, and, and so what we do is we create a union of all the, um, the rules inside of your, your package and figure out the class path from that. And so in this simple package, um, we have two um, external dependencies on the main class path. So that white jar um, icon means it's on the uh, main class path. And then there's three jars that are on the test class path. And so uh, Bazel Eclipse does a lot of work behind the scenes with Bazel Query and with um, aspects to figure out um, the unified class path for that package. And so uh, once we do that, um, we're able to support uh, IDE development uh, pretty easily. And so the only other thing I wanted to show with this workspace is um, we also create a, um, a global class path with all the jars in the entire workspace. And the reason we do that is um, when you do, when you import maybe only 10 packages of your workspace and you maybe have 500 packages, um, not all the jars that you have available in your Bazel workspace may be um, a part of an existing class path. And so what we do here is we just create a, a, just, a, just a huge gigantic list of all the, all the jars being used inside of your workspace um, so that you can do uh, type searches for that. And so um, with that, I'm going to um, switch over to another uh, workspace, Bazel workspace, and I'm also going to show import as part of that. So the way we integrate is with this import um, uh, wizard. And we're going to go look at a, another uh, Bazel workspace from our demo set. And it is different Guava versions. And um, like I was saying before, you can selectively import um, just a subset of your, of your Bazel packages. In this case, I'm just going to select everything. But um, that's, that's a way to minimize how much a developer is looking at, they can just you know uh, import the um, the packages that they want to work on. And so um, in this workspace, there's um, the demo is we have two versions of Guava in this workspace. And so um, this package old Guava is using 18, and modern Guava is using 23. And um, I just wanted to show you how the class path feature works inside of um, Bazel Eclipse. Um, so we have in uh, modern Guava.java, we have um, this uh, the, the use of this class here, which only appears in Guava 23. It's not in 18. So then if we go down to old Guava here, um, and we try and use that class, um, it's going to complain because it's not on, uh, it's not in Guava 18. And so um, so that's just showing you how um, in Bazel Eclipse, um, the class path is scoped to the package. And so that can give you some ability um, to be a little more um, selective about how um, you, know, you see your class path in each, in each package. And uh, an upcoming feature um, is something uh, we plan to do with this, which is called uh, auto depths. Um, so the company Wix uh, demonstrated this in IntelliJ a few years ago, and we're pretty close to having this ability in uh, in Bazel Eclipse, which is to um, then give you an automated way of adding that dependency that you're missing to your class path in um, in your build file. But we don't have that quite yet. All right, so that was Bazel Eclipse. I hope you liked the demos. Now we're gonna. Um, send it over to Gunnar, who's going to talk about the language server. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, so the uh, the Bazel language server that I'm going to talk about and also have a demo prepared is uh, essentially 
the headless piece of the basic eclipse feature. And the way it works so beautifully is that the, uh, the Java language support in VS Code is entirely based uh, on Eclipse as well. Um, let's, let's have a look. So obviously, you will see the same features that you see in, in the VS Code that you know from the VS Code Java support as well as from the basic Eclipse feature. Uh, we do support full and partial, uh, partial project views. That's very important, especially when working on a monolith in large uh, code bases. You don't want to load all the files into VS Code. Um, class path uh, support is exactly the same as in the basic Eclipse feature. Uh, so any new support that gets added into the basic Eclipse feature or into uh, um, the basic language server will benefit both projects equally. We do support running the bug of Java applications in VS Code and also um, running and debugging unit tests with uh, the test support that exists in VS Code. For, uh, for now, we still require you to manually download uh, the extension for VS Code and install it. Uh, eventually, we want to go and publish it into the marketplace, the VS Code marketplace. However, uh, we have not decided yet on the final naming uh, for this. All right, so let's jump into a little demo. First thing we'll do is go to the Git repo of the Bezel VS Code for Java development extension. And uh, there you'll have the link to the releases page. And on the releases page, uh, there will always be uh, the latest release published by our GitHub build action, um, where you can download the VS Code extension file. So click on the file and save it to a local folder. In this demo, I'm going to uh, use a little small sample project that we created and published on GitHub as well. Uh, so it just contains uh, three modules, which look pretty similar to uh, Maven modules. They have Java folder with source code and some and the build file. And make sure it builds, because uh, this is very important. And Let's start code in this directory. So once VS Code opens, the first thing we'll do is we'll install the extension from the file. And you click on the three dots, and then you say, select install from VSIX file. And there, uh, you just select the file that we downloaded from our code repository from the releases page. And you let that finish, it will actually install um, not just uh, the VS Code for Java extension that we built, but it, it will also install a couple of additional extensions, uh, mainly for debug supporting, for running tests, and the language server that is uh, shipped by Red Hat. Once the installation finished, I would like you to uh, make you aware of a few important settings that you have to do uh, in your user configuration. So the first two items, I recommend disabling Maven and Gradle support. Uh, the third one, which is pretty important, uh, you need to enable um, the uh, Bazel importer for GDTLS uh, for the Java language server. Uh, so you need to set basil.enable to true. Um, the default is still false. And then there is two more options, one for the source path and then more from the test path. So the way the, um, uh, the Bazel project uh, kind of works is similar to how Bazel Eclipse feature works, is that it detects or it expects a common layout in the project. And to that, in that common layout, you can actually configure um, the uh, path, the location of the source folder and the test sources. And then it will set up the class path probably for those. Okay, so once you have those settings set up, um, let's restart VS Code one more time and then we're ready to uh, open a source file. Okay, so once VS Code is back up, let's open our first Java file. It will start the language server. You can track the language server starting with the spinning wheel on the bottom. Um, it is actually now analyzing the project, scanning for the base build files, and discovering packages. 
once everything is ready, uh, you will see this the thumbs up. That's pretty important. Uh, if you don't see it, uh, something might wrong, so you need to check the log file. And now we're ready for some Java development. Content Assist is available. It works based on the class path, what's specified in the base of build files as dependencies. This is extremely similar to a base of Eclipse. An interesting feature that is also supported is running um, code and debugging code right from within VS Code. So with the debug extension, uh, you can just uh, click on this little debug highlight, and then it jumps, uh, starts the, the main applet, the Java code in debug mode, and stops at the breakpoint that we have here. And then you can just use regular stepping and run it. What else can you do? Um, navigation. So you can follow and jump into the methods um, that define something. For a full list of all available features, please go to the redhead-developer slash VS Code-Java repository. It has a list of features that are supported by the VS Code Java extension and the Java language server for VS Code. And the Bazel extension that we've built is, is literally just an extension or a plugin into that Red Hat language server for VS Code. OK, that was it for the demo. Yeah, so the, the other thing um, that we're looking at uh, in the future for the Bethel language server is um, we want your feedback. If this is useful, if there's interest in the community in this effort, uh, if, if, if there's someone interested in moving this forward with us, uh, then we're totally open uh, to collaborating on this. Uh, specifically, there's things like Windows support that um, we're totally not uh, testing a language server with. Uh, also, if you have more complicated Java-based projects, uh, we want to we hear from you uh, and uh, also possibly see your contributions, um, how the class path is working out for you, or if you're experiencing uh, lack of support for specific uh, situations. All right, and that's it. Thanks very much for joining our session. I'm looking forward to uh, your questions and contributions. Thank you, everyone.